In 2001, one of the most influential books in recent history was published. Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanczyk published Critical Race Theory, an introduction. They clarified that CRT was unlike traditional civil rights, as the movement that had apparently been exhausted by the late 70s. Traditional civil rights aimed for slow, incremental progress in the lives of black people. CRT, on the other hand, asserted that incremental changes could not meaningfully take place because they're always being fought back down by the system of oppression instituted by all white people. Therefore, as Delgado and Stefanczyk believed, the whole system needed to be disrupted and dismantled, and a new one set up to replace it, to do things right this time. Go figure. And so, the CRT fervor was notched up again. In 2003, the critical mass argument from Regents vs. Backey was brought back into the mainstream by Angelo and Chetta in Revisiting Backey. This was done in preparation for the upcoming decision on the case of Grutter vs. Bollinger. He fixated on the critical mass argument from the original case, advocating for more preferential admissions to college for racial and sexual minorities. Anchetta derived his understanding of race from Michael Omi and Howard Winnant, who are plainly Gramscian in their philosophies. They developed the racial formation theory as an analytical tool to look at race as a socially constructed identity. By their teachings, the content and importance of racial categories are determined by social, economic, and political means, meaning they, and Anchetta after them, directly support structural material determinism. In his book, Anchetta laid out the details of the original court case, and then dove into identity Marxism advocation. As many people before him, Anchetta argued that colleges and universities needed a substantial amount of minorities to be truly diverse, otherwise the few applicants of minority status would be tokenized. And that idea played out in Grutter vs. Bollinger. The decision in this case affirmed and amplified the decision in Baki. The critical mass theory was completely vindicated, the activists were emboldened, and the multi-billion dollar DEI industry we have now was built on the back of these two decisions. Skipping forward to 2007, B. E. Vaughn published The History of Diversity Training and Its Pioneers, a historical summary similar to CRT, the writings that form the movement. He wrote this article for Strategic Diversity and Inclusion Management magazine, and later republished in Diversity Officer magazine, if that tells you the purpose of the writing. He affirmed the claim that diversity education was a reaction to the civil rights movement, and that the main point of race education was to highlight the differences between races, totally in opposition to meritocratic traditions. He mentions diversity hot seat trainings. This is where a group of people, be it a class, office, or other organization, are split into two groups based on power dynamics, typically separated by race. Through the training, all the white people confess various microaggressions, thoughts of hatred, or forms of varied oppression against the black or brown people sitting directly across from them. These were originally done all the way back in the 1940s and early 50s by the US military, but were abandoned for causing too much strife. And yet without reform, these trainings were imported directly into critical pedagogy, critical legal studies, and race-conscious training sessions in many companies. Importantly, Vaughn notes that the white participants acted in three ways when confronted like this. One group of whites became more insightful about the barriers to race relations as a result of being put on the hot seat during the encounters. Another group became more resistant to racial harmony as they fought against accepting the facilitator's label of them as racists. A third group became what the military referred to as fanatics. These individuals began advocating against any forms of racial injustice after the training. So a portion of them became insightful and changed their worldviews in some way. A portion became resistant and defensive after the attacks, and most importantly, a portion became fanatical. These people became obsessed with seeking out and destroying any form of race oppression and believed that any resources not put toward that goal were wasted. Of course, this allowed the powerful diversity officers and trainers to demean and harass the merely introspective people, purge and fire the defensive and resistant ones, and give immense power to the fanatics. If history has taught us anything, it's that fanaticism shouldn't be given power. But if people knew their history, they wouldn't be communists. I will briefly mention Darold Wing Sue in his article titled Microaggressions More Than Just Race in 2010. He didn't coin the term microaggression, but he did indicate that they are the everyday slights, snubs, or insults, whether intentional or unintentional, 
which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based solely upon their marginalized group membership. Chester Pierce actually coined the term way back in 1970 in Offensive Mechanisms, the Vehicle for Microaggression. Pierce saw that not much real racism was happening after MLK, so he searched for it in tiny doses. He wrote, One must not look for the gross and obvious. The subtle, cumulative mini-assault is the substance of today's racism. Microaggressions are small but build up over time to something dangerous and deadly. They may seem like a joke, but Daryl Dwing Su served as an advisor to President Bill Clinton in 1996. This stuff goes up to the highest levels.